dear friends welcome to the second course in the journalism and mass communication program in a democratic society the media is considered the fourth pillar that supports the system the other three being the legislature judiciary and the executive needless to say the role of the media in upholding order rule of law and social harmony is as important as that of the arms of the government the courts and the bureaucracy to understand what this relationship is and how it works it is important to have an idea of the socio economic and political scenario of our country from the historical perspective to the contemporary times the objective is to understand the basics of the social economic and political issues that face our country and the role that the media is supposed to play while writing about them at the same time it is important to understand the restraints and constraints that the media must face and exercise while discharging its duties in the first course we talked about writing for the media where we discussed what kind of media writing was to be done and we noted that political and business writing were considered to be among the most important writings whether it was news or analysis or editorials there is no denying the fact that the media is among the fastest growing sectors of the world today and more and more people today are getting influenced by the media than ever before today all of us take the independent functioning of the media as an essential part of our democratic society to the extent that it is often taken for granted when it comes to writing for the media it may be recalled that news news analysis and editorial are among the most significant kinds of writing at the same time writing on political and business issues is among the most widely read kinds of media writing as it touches the lives of every citizen obviously for anyone aspiring to make a mark in the media world writing on political and business issues is the main objective for political and business writing to be effective it is important to understand the major social political and economic issues that influence us such issues even if they seem to be topical always have a historical background that can be traced to past events as we realize that in a democratic society the media is considered to be the fourth pillar supporting the democratic structure the understanding of issues and decision making capacity among the media persons is supposed to be of the same level as that in the members of the legislature judiciary or executive this is to say that not only a certain maturity is expected to reflect in media writing but this maturity must come from a clear understanding of socio political and economic issues prevailing in the country to get an overview of the socio political and economic scenario we will have to travel a little into the past to get a picture of the factors that caused the situation to develop into what it is today so let's have a look into the early scene of our country during the independence struggle the nascent indian media played a key role in giving direction support and guidance to the political as well as the revolutionary movement for ending the british rule luminaries of the freedom struggle right from mahatma gandhi to ganesh shankar vidyarthi used the media to inspire the people to rise up against the colonial rule it can rightly be said that before independence the socio economic and political scenario in the country was defined by one single objective 
that was attaining independence from the British rule. The media at that time, in spite of not being as organized as a profession and not having acquired the status of an industry, did play a crucial role in spreading the light of freedom and democratic values. Even though the publications at that time did not feature much about issues of poverty alleviation, employment generation, neglect of villages, poor governance and corruption, the prime focus was on social, spiritual and educational information plus local advertising of the most disorganized kind. Since independence, India has faced several social, political and economic problems. In fact, had it been any other non-democratic country, the very future of the nation and the democratic system would have faced a severe crisis. But the system of having universal franchise and an elected government always helped the government and the people tide over the crisis and our nation has grown mature as a democracy with elections being held at the central level and the state's level with regularity. The forthcoming discussion on the issues facing our nation today is aimed at creating sensitivity among young media persons so that a proper response and the do's and don'ts could be devised in each case. Now, these are the issues that can be considered to be among the important ones although the list, I must say, is not exhaustive. The list contains political, social and economic issues from the media's perspective. Political issues. Among the political issues which create a right or the wrong kind of perspective in the media, the first issue is religious and caste related violence. Second is terrorism. Third is Naxalism or Maoist insurgency and the fourth is political crisis arising out of political rivalry. Social issues. Social issues mainly comprise territorial movements among the states, linguistic and educational disputes again among the states and regions, corruption and indiscipline and population and health related issues. Economic issues comprise subjects like poverty and the economic divide, agricultural and industrial production, liberalization and economic reforms, and impact of market forces and market influence. Every issue, regardless of its time period of its occurrence, has had an inevitable impact on the working of the media. It means that the government and the political response to various social, political and economic problems also fashioned a change in the response of the media to that problem. This change showed itself in the style of reporting and writing, the use of certain words, phrases and expressions in, in reporting, the attitude and approach of reporters and editors towards these problems, the expectation of the readers and the people in general and also the response of the government in keeping with the changed approach of the media. Let us start with the political scenario first. In this category, the most serious issue having a deep, wide-ranging and long-lasting impact on the people, society and the nation in general is that of religious and caste based violence. Now we all know that India is a secular state. In fact, it is guaranteed by the constitution of India. But the states of our nation have been rocked by communal or religious violence from time to time since independence and before that also. In fact, the root to this kind of violence can be traced to the very creation of two nations in 1947 on religious lines. 
in recent decades communal tensions and religion based politics have become more prominent and consequently religious violence in india has increasingly become what academics believe to be organized attacks on members of one community or religion by the other riots between the majority hindu community and the minority muslim community used to be very frequent in the last few decades the media has always been very careful in writing about such conflicts the most noted and visible example is the use of the word minority community and majority community which was used and is still used by the newspapers instead of writing hindus and muslims when writing about a conflict situation this caution is almost always exercised the purpose was to avoid causing provocation and creating tension between the two warring communities while the restraint in actual reporting still continues the names of the communities are often seen to be used perhaps as a reflection of the growing acknowledgement that openness and transparency in reporting such events are better than beating around the bush immediately after independence the socio political environment in india as well as the newly created neighboring nation pakistan was communally surcharged and this reflected in the media as well the creation of communal or religion led parties increased communal feelings the mass migration of people from the then west pakistan in 1947 just after independence brought vast social disorganization in india many of these immigrant families became homeless and set out wandering from one place to the other these men women and children lost traditional community relationships and had weak or no family ties they were and they did feel also displaced not only geographically but also socially and economically the governments both central as well as the states did their best to rehabilitate them by providing residential accommodation preference in employment vocational training loans for business and settlement of their property claims but in spite of all this many families could not be rehabilitated bringing about economic dependence and disorganization in those families from the media's point of view a sympathetic approach to their problems continued for decades and the settlements of such immigrants were for a long time known as refugee colony or refugee market and so on but in later years as the sensibilities improved and so did the settlers economic condition the nomenclature was changed and now one will hardly find in any city in india any colony with the name of refugee colony or refugee market because they are no longer considered refugees from the former west pakistan however the feeling of communal divide against the muslims of pakistan at the hands of whom many immigrants had suffered continued and many political and social organizations having their origin in those times gave vent to this ire in their public pronouncements it must be noted that religious tensions have been there in india since the muslim invaders came to india centuries ago but the degree of such tension has been high or low with time during the british rule it was deliberately created by the british whose policy it was to divide and rule the electorate was formed on the basis of religion and this often caused much bloodshed between activists of the two sides although the communal tension lessened to some extent after independence yet it has not completely died out 
the existence of prejudice among members of both the community towards one another has not ended completely such prejudices often lead to discrimination both these elements prejudice and discrimination are symptoms of social disorganization as well as the cause of social disorganization symptoms and cause Prejudice has always been part of the cultural pattern all over the world. The chief reasons for such prejudices are cultural, religious, endogamous and personal. In brief, the cultural factor involves special dietary habits, what one eats and what one does not eat, special rhythms of work and holiday over the course of days in the week, special family relationships. Religious factors involve different conceptions about God and the different ways of finding it, ways for prayers and so on. Endogamous factors involve marriage within the group and intermarriage being regarded with disfavor. Personal factors include a sense of fear, frustration and insecurity among the group, manifesting in occasional aggressive and offensive behavior. With this background, one must admit that the attitude of the media has also been colored with such prejudices when it came to religious issues. In the absence of professionalism among working journalists in the early years, and also because of the fact that many journalists had also suffered in the communally surcharged atmosphere of that period, the prejudice often showed itself in the earlier years. However, it has been in the later decades, especially after the 70s, that growing awareness, educational openness, economic transformation and arrival of the post-independence generation has led to a change in attitudes. However, the floodgates to such discords were opened again in 1989 when the Mandel Commission report regarding giving reservation to the other backward castes of the OBCs in educational institutions and government jobs was implemented. While this led to a nationwide agitation between the pro and the anti-reservation social groups, the media also find, found itself divided on this issue. While many jumped the bandwagon of social justice and openly supported the reservation and the reservation, uh, the system of reservation. Many publications, newspapers, etc., had a more cautious approach, suggesting that merit and not caste should be the criteria for any kind of reservation. While the debate still continues, today social justice or to borrow a Western phrase, affirmative action is accepted by all as a remedy for centuries long, long standing discrimination against sections of society on the basis of caste. The emergence of a pro Hindu unity movement immediately after the Mandal agitation is often seen as the move on the part of some political parties to unite the Hindu community, which was getting divided on the basis of castes because of the Mandal recommendations. This move manifested itself as the movement for the Ram temple in Ayodhya. Nationwide rallies were organized to raise a call for making the Ram temple in Ayodhya and not surprisingly, this was a turning point for the media in India as well. Million Indian Muslims. Advani's aggressive gamble became the central theme of Indian politics for 10 years. Because of this issue, Hindu nationalism found renewed success. On the 6th of December 1992, a crowd of Hindu extremists bypassed indecisive officials and the unmotivated forces of law and order and reduced the mosque to rubble.
riots broke out throughout India. Muslims were hunted down, and in Bombay, the scenes of violence recalled the massacres of the partition era. The horrific strategy paid off. Muslims were now held responsible for all the evils and all the failures in a country which was 80% Hindu. The nationalists reaped the harvest of their hate campaign. In 1998, they won the national elections and governed the country for six years. I think most, perhaps most important of all is that the Gandhi believed very strongly always in talking to your opponent, to winning your opponent around um, by, by dialogue, by conversation, uh, also by charm, but, but, but by trying to win people over. You know, by, 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 by using your influence. In fact, this was perhaps the first instance of the media also getting divided on religious lines and several instances are on record when publications openly sided with the temple movement either for the love of Hinduism or for the sake of keeping the Hindu flock united. The destruction of the disputed shrine Ram Janam Bhumi or Babri Masjid at Ayodhya on December 6, 1992 at the hands of some activists saw the media also writing about the event in different tunes and tones. Before the destruction of the disputed structure, the shrine was mostly referred to in media writings as the disputed structure or the disputed shrine. But afterwards, it was simply mentioned as Babri Masjid or Ram Janambhumi, depending upon which side or community one belonged to or was prepared to represent. The incidence of widespread religious violence in the aftermath of 1992, including the Bombay blasts, saw the media play a role that was not always objective. Today, Social scientists and media researchers tend to agree that perhaps this was for the first time that the media in India had to face a tough situation and media persons had to go through personal trauma whether they were Hindus or Muslims. Examples of reporters and editors also having heated discussion among themselves over the language of a report or the display of a report are many. While it is not proper to name such people or publications, it is sufficient to say that the media ultimately emerged much wiser and mature after this episode. In recent times, there has been incidents of Hindutva forces growing militant. Hinduism is a religion while Hindutva is a political ideology. The Hindutva movement is not supported by a majority of Hindus and the reporting about such incidents of trouble involving Hindutva elements has been a very sensitive issue in the media. For expressions like minority appeasement and natural reaction of the majority community, they keep flying in the air, making objectivity a victim of prejudice. Personal faith and belief have often influenced professional judgment. It is difficult to be conclusive on this subject, but every such incident leads to new learning and media persons all over India agree that one learns chiefly by having an open mind, by being logical and by having a larger public interest and a larger picture in the perspective. The situation in the troubled state of Jammu and Kashmir is also one example of religious violence impacting the media. It is estimated that since March 1990, about 2,50,000 to 3 lakh pundits, that is the Hindu Brahmins, have migrated outside Kashmir due to persecution by the pro-Pakistan Islamic fundamentalists. The proportion of Kashmiri pundits in the Kashmir Valley has dropped from 15% in 1947 to, by some estimates, less than 0.1% since the insurgency in Kashmir took on a religious and sectarian flavor. 
the response of the security forces while dealing with decidedly pro-Pakistan Kashmir separatists and Islamic fundamentalists is often brutal and high-handed and a violation of human rights or civil rights is not uncommon. In the light of these facts, writing in the media about violence in Jammu and Kashmir remains the most hazard, hazardous kind of media writing in India today. While it is not easy to be completely objective in such a situation, putting curbs on the media when the situation becomes too tense or explosive seems a way out to the authorities. Once again, it is not easy to champion the cause of a free media if the free media appears to sympathize with elements which appear anti-national or divisive forces. The answer to such a dilemma mostly lies in being as objective as possible so that one may strike the right balance between one's nationalism and professionalism. In recent years, there has been an increase in violent attacks on Christians in India. The acts of violence include burning down of churches, reconversion of Christians to Hinduism, distribution of threatening literature, attacks on nuns, murder of Christian priests, and destruction of Christian schools and missions. It is often found that this violence is an expression of a spontaneous anger of the locals against forcible conversion activities undertaken by the Christian missionaries. In states like Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Andhra Pradesh and Odisha, where conversions take place as a routine matter, many social organizations keep raising their voices against this activity and one can see the media also often take sides while writing about it. In conclusion, it would appear that religious violence, howsoever abhorrent, keeps happening in the most civilized areas and the most backward areas as well. While there is a need to spread social awareness in this regard, the media often becomes a party. This is a sign of an immature media and consequently the symptom of a deeper malaise. Religion, as we all agree, is a personal matter and the need to keep it that way and not wear it on the sleeve and appear a Hindu journalist or a Muslim journalist is very important. Those who would like to do so should better join a theology institution rather than a newspaper. Caste issues, on the other hand, are much more difficult to wear out. Today, it is difficult to find someone who would be content to be called a mere Hindu or a mere Indian. And the introduction is not complete unless one adds either with a sense of pride or aggression that he is a Brahmin or Kaistha, Yadav or Dalit. It is very difficult to trace the origin of the caste system. Various theories have been going and given around regarding its origin and growth such as traditional Hindu theory, racial theory, occupational or functional theory, religious theory and the Varna system. But none of them explains it in a scientific way. It is generally believed that there were four Varnas in the beginning and in due course of time these were divided into a number of castes and sub-castes due to different occupations and professions, each distinguished from the other in custom, which would not allow intermarriage or interdining between one caste and the other. It was some sort of social satisfaction and stratification dividing society into various groups on the basis of occupation, customs, marriage restrictions and some type of superiority and inferiority complexes vis-a-vis -vis the other castes. Now here lies the difficulty in tiding over the caste differences. The biggest disadvantage of the caste system would be that people become inflexible in occupations 
and would want to follow their occupation even if they are capable of giving it up or vice versa they would not like to do something even if they do it well better than the others such differences are common in their media world also and they come out into the open when it comes to writing about certain issues or more frequently in professional decisions such as selection appointments promotions etc such divisions reflect themselves when writing about caste issues and caste violence incidents of caste violence involving so called lower caste and upper caste groups have been fairly common in the decade of the 70s to 90s and have receded quite drastically since then caste violence does not spread that easily and quickly as religious violence would but the impact is much more horizontal and localized however today with the caste discrimination having been taken care of to a large extent because of growing education and availability of opportunities for all the media today appears more sensitized to dealing with caste violence than previously also in case of some states where the caste system was endemic and conflicts between the caste were frequent the change in political regime where the political leadership has moved from the upper caste to the other caste it has helped in spreading out awareness about coexistence between the castes and therefore the existence of caste based militant groups is no longer that widespread as it used to be say about two decades ago now let us come to the problem of terrorism as a political issue there was a time in the decade of the 60s when the term terrorism was unheard of terror is something that is caused on purpose by someone or some people to create fear and subsequently some ulterior purpose is served the first time terrorism came to be recognized as an institutionalized activity was in the decade of the 70s when the arab israeli conflict saw aircraft hijackings bombings assassinations hostage taking and then to some extent the conflict over the ireland issue between ireland and britain also saw violence in that region in rest of the world terrorism was not a widespread activity in india terrorism made its presence felt in the 90s in the aftermath of the ayodhya shrine demolition the actual destruction of the disputed structure was taken as an affront by the community and public pronouncements were made in many parts of the world that india will have to pay heavily for this act and keeping true to their promise terror forces made india the next and the more permanent kind of destination it must be mentioned here <coughs> that it is not always that terror is caused by groups outside india although in most of the cases the training and the planning could be done outside but there could be certain elements within india also which are aiding this activity the first major terror attack in india was in march 1993 when hundreds of innocent people died in serial bomb explosions in many places in bombay which is now known as mumbai the ferocity of the act took everyone by surprise and the terrorist announced their arrival literally with a bang since then tens of thousands of people have lost their lives in bomb explosions in public places markets halls trains buses
temples, court compounds, roadsides, parks, railway stations, bus stations and on bicycles, in tiffin boxes, in pressure cookers, in buckets, parcels and so on. The parliament house building also has not been spared by terrorists as well as a big temple complex like Akshadham or busy marketplaces in Delhi, repeated attacks in Bombay, Bangalore and so on. The most recent and the most spectacular and horrendous terrorist attack was in Mumbai in November 2008 when a handful of heavily armed terrorists attacked several places including hotels in Mumbai and took hundreds of people and the buildings under their control for over three days. It was a well-knit and well-coordinated exercise that shook the entire world and made everyone feel vulnerable to similar attacks anytime, anywhere in the world. In the last 18 years, terror attacks have been made on cities across India, from Mumbai to New Delhi, Bangalore, Ahmedabad, Jaipur, Guwahati, Hyderabad, Varanasi, Srinagar, Pune and many more. In most cases, 
the perpetrators were found to be Islamic fundamentalists operating on the instructions of handlers abroad with the assistance of local operatives. Terrorism in India has often been alleged to be sponsored by the neighboring country Pakistan. After most acts of terrorism in India, many journalists and politicians accuse Pakistan's intelligence agency, the ISI or the Inter -service Services Intelligence of playing a role. Recently, both the US and Afghanistan have also accused Pakistan of carrying out terrorist acts in Afghanistan. The media's response in reporting terror acts has been quite on expected lines. It ranges from being loudly extravagant to overtly critical and from inadvertently interfering to unnecessarily grumpy. It appears that even a decade or so of dealing with terrorism and terrorism related events has not prepared our media persons to be mature enough and to act maturely enough to retain objectivity and self-control. In the aftermath of every terrorist activity, certain phrases are repeated, certain allegations fly around, such certain shortcomings are always highlighted and so on. As if it is a common crime which has been happening again and again. Terrorism, we must understand, is a sensitive issue and the subsequent investigations are even more so. The investigations into terrorism and terrorism related acts cannot be done on the same lines as investigating a routine law and order activity. In keeping with its creed, the media does launch its own investigations into all kinds and all incidents of crime and terrorism also seems to be no exception. Very often, the authorities, in spite of their bungling and their, their shortcomings, they, they seem more interested in creating hurdles in the way of the media's functioning and all attempts of the media to pick holes in preventive or investigative measures are dubbed as anti-establishment and very often media persons are punished or subjected to trouble while doing their duty. It has been noticed that in case of whether it was the Bombay blasts, whether it was the parliament house attack and attacks in other cities, the media did launch their own investigations and found that either the police force or the intelligence activity or the routine patrolling, there was some shortage somewhere which led to a, a lowering of guard against terrorist attacks and it facilitated the attack to happen and cause much more wider damage. But whenever the media has written about such shortcomings, it has not gone too well with the establishment which thinks that the, me the media by highlighting these shortcomings is trying to divert attention from the actual investigation by the agencies and therefore the media is creating hurdles in the investigation which may not be true always. It must be understood that terrorism is not a simple crime and it may require sophisticated systems and setup to go into a deeper conspiracy. The media or rather the individual media persons may have the capability to do so. The media and the media persons as individuals may have connections and contacts and they might have the knowledge and the background information to go on conducting their own small little investigations and therefore the, in the establishment or the law enforcement agencies in such cases must ideally take the media as their ally as being on their own side but unfortunately this does not always happen. The establishment somehow thinks of the media always as an adversary. 
the problems arise when either an over enthusiastic enforcement official a policeman or an or an intelligence officer or on the other side an ambitious media person attempts to hog the limelight come to the front come in front of the camera give interviews give some bites and so on or worse beat the other to glory i did it he did it he did not do it and so on as if to say that it is some kind of a race between the media and the agencies to emerge the winner which it is not as a result of such conflict the entire community of media person suffers a crisis of credibility while imposition of some restrictions may be necessary and needs to be accepted by the media as granting access to the site of an of an incident or talking to the accused persons or talking to the victims or eye witnesses and so on at the same time the right of the media to do its own bit of probing also needs to be acknowledged by the establishment the media by its nature will not always go by what the police or the officers tell them it will go on their own it will go on a different path and try to find out whether what the authorities are saying is true or not whether facts are being hidden whether things are being glossed over whether some 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 non existent facts are being bandied about if such restriction and consideration is not shown by either side a conflict is bound to arise terrorism ultimately harms not only one institution but an entire society and the entire nation the media's attempts at finding out the truth need to be considered in this light they are not being anti national when they say that the police patrol at a road block was busy in extortion when it was supposed to check a vehicle carrying armed terrorists at the same time if an off duty policeman was pressed into duty in an emergency to deal with a terrorism situation does not mean that the media must write that the duty norms were not followed during the crisis in both the situations it is not normal to quote such things when the situation itself is abnormal since a religious or any other extremist thought lies at the root cause of terrorism it is important to understand that it would not be eliminated easily in fact terror acts are becoming more and more sophisticated with the use of state of the art gadgets and highly trained and motivated planners and attackers as the nation and the state machinery grapples with the problem the media also is evolving its own code to deal with it in fact with the discovery that many educated and uh, professional professionally trained people were involved in giving support and shelter to terrorists and terrorist sympathizers now everybody becomes a suspect and in some circles it is said that the media also must be careful in looking within whether there are people who could be putting across a thought or a story which is not true deliberately to mislead the investigation a recent example is the continuous live telecast of the mumbai terror attacks or the 2611 attacks as we call them since the news television channels showed the planning of the security agencies and their movements as well the same was available to the attackers also in their hideout and they were able to plan their next move and escape easily it has now come to be known with the in interrogation of the one terrorist who was caught alive that they had access to gadgets like uh, mobile phone with tv and so on and they could make out what the security agencies were doing 
and such information was easily available to them and to the rest of the world because of the television news channels. Now, while the media cannot be faulted on being quick, correct, on the job and on time and being the first in the race to give the news, the propriety of showing the police preparations and strategies can certainly be questioned since in actual fact it ultimately helped the terrorists and not the police. The media should have thought about this before and later they actually did as a result of which a consensus was evolved as to how in future the media's live telecast does not end up helping the terrorists in their anti-national missions. In fact, in many countries in, in the US and in the West where the media is free, there is a regular meeting platform between the media persons that is channel editors and the administration executives and officials to discuss as to how the media should work in tandem with the administration to not only create awareness about how to check terrorist activities but also to ensure that anything which the media does in its routine job does not end up helping the terrorists whether it is a case of profiling or a case of airport security and so on and so forth. In India the situation has not uh, gone to that extent but there are uh, some people in the media who believe that the uh, uh, situation of coexistence and working on the same lines should be evolved between the media and the establishment rather they being in confrontation with each other all the time. With the socio-political environment across the country having become very sensitive to the issue of terrorism, the people in general and the media in particular need to be careful not to create unnecessary panic and also do not get caught napping in the event of a crisis. Social conflicts actually end up making all concerned much wiser and dealing with terrorism has also done so. It has also made all of us very wise and the media especially so. Now the media in most cases does not treat acts of terrorism and related stories in a very light manner. Every small thing related with terrorist activity is given due seriousness and is given the weight, the space and the display which it deserves. With this, we come to an end of this part of the discussion on socio-economic and political scenario and the media perspective towards them. To recap, we saw that for mature and effective media writing on political and business issues, it was important to understand the current scenario prevailing around us. Many aspects of the current scenario had their roots in history and the past. Unless one understood them, it was not possible to have a clarity of thought and therefore writing may not become very effective. Among the political issues, religious and caste violence, terrorism, ultra-left Maoist insurgency and political rivalry are considered the most important that need to be understood. While religious and caste violence had their roots in age-old prejudices and discrimination, the media also had not been immune to such prejudices. With growing awareness, economic growth and opening up of opportunities, such prejudices are getting diluted and affirmative action has been playing a key role towards this end. Terrorism on the other hand is a relatively new phenomenon and the media in India is getting acquainted with it quickly and with the 
occurrence of every terrorist act. While the media does have the right to be objective, independent and quick, it must also guard against its activities ending up in helping anti-national elements. Today, as the world learns to live with terrorism, the media also has learnt that sometimes discretion is the better part of proactivism. In our next discussion, we shall discuss the other aspects of the political, social and economic scenario with the media's perspective. Till then, keep up with your reading and try to look for examples and incidents of the media's correct understanding of the nation's socio-political scenario. Thank you and my best wishes.